Welcome to the audiovisual translation of the BBI report. I am grateful for you having taken your time to come listen to this audiovisual report. This marks the beginning of introduction of the 12 chapters of the report and Annex 1, 2 and 3. Kindly note we will have the translation of the BBI report chapter after chapter until we reach the last chapter of the report. Also note, this audiovisual report is created by the use of text synthesizer, hence there might be alliteration in the pronunciation of some words, particularly Swahili words, but this is not a big issue as you can clearly decode all the wording in this audiovisual report. Kindly feel free to share the link to this report with other members of our community. Having said that without further ado let's jump into the beginning of introduction of the 12 chapters of the report. <music> Building Bridges to a United Kenya. From a Nation of Blood Ties to a Nation of Ideal, a report by the Presidential Task Force on Building Bridges to Unity Advisory October 2019. Your Excellency, you appointed this task force by Gazette Notice No. 5154, published on 31 May 2018. It was our privilege, as per the mandate, to evaluate the national challenges outlined in the joint communique of building bridges to a new Kenyan nation, and having done so, make practical recommendations and reform proposals that build lasting unity. We conducted comprehensive public consultations that included meetings with citizens in all 47 counties, hearing from elected leaders at the national and county levels, senior state officers, constitutional commissions, civil society and professional organizations, cultural leaders, the private sector, and subject matter experts. The face of Kenya was captured in this process. More than 7,000 citizens from all ethnic groups, genders, cultural and religious practices, and different social and economic sectors were consulted. The task force heard from more than 400 elected leaders past and present, prominent local voices from the community, and young people who added their voice to citizens in the counties, 123 individuals representing major institutions, including constitutional bodies and major stakeholders in the public and private sectors, 261 individuals and organizations who sent memoranda via email, and 755 citizens who offered handwritten submissions during public forums in the counties. The result is the following policy, administrative reform proposals for each identified challenge area. We now have the honor to submit our report and to express our gratitude for the privilege to be of service to the nation and to express our highest esteem to your excellency. Senator Muhammad Yusuf Haji, chairperson and member, Professor Adam Zalu, vice chairperson and member, Mrs. Agnes Kavindu Muthama, member, Senator Amos Waco, member, Dr. Florence Amosa, member, Professor Saeed Mwaguni, member, Mr. James Madandura, member, Major John C., member, Bishop Lawi Imithu, member, Honorable Mazen Lishumo, member, Professor Marampi Ole Aronke, member, Bishop Peter Njenga, member, Honorable Rose Museo, Archbishop Zacchaeus Okath, member, Joint Secretaries, Ambassador Martin Kamani, Mr. Paul Mwangi, The Kenya Gazette 31 May 2018, page 1658, Gazette Notice No. 5154, Establishment of Task Force on Building Bridges to Unity Advisory. It is notified for the general information of the public that His Excellency. Honorable. Yuhuru Kenyatta, President and Commander-in-Chief of the Kenya Defense Forces, has established a task force to be known as the Building Bridges to Unity Advisory Task Force. The task force shall comprise Adam Zalu, Dr. Agnes Kavindu, Ms. Senator Amos Waco. Florence. Amos, Ms. Said Mwanguni, Professor. James Madandura. Major, RTD, John C. Bishop Lawi Imithu. Mazen Lashomo. Senator Muhammad Yusuf Haji. Marampi. Olair Ankai, Professor. Bishop Peter Njenga. Rose Masu. Archbishop Zechi Okath. Joint Secretaries. Ambassador Martin Kamani. Paul Mwangi. 1. The terms of reference of the task force are to a. Evaluate the national challenges outlined in the joint communique of building bridges to a new Kenyan nation, and having done so, make practical recommendations and reform proposals that build lasting unity. b. Outline the policy, administrative reform proposals, and implementation modalities for each identified challenge area, and c. Conduct consultations with citizens, the faith-based sector, cultural leaders, the private sector and experts at both the county and national levels. Two. In the performance of its functions, the task force a. shall regulate its own procedures including appointing revolving co-chairs from among its members, b. regulate its own procedure while working within confines of the Constitution, c. 
She'll privilege bipartisan and nonpartisan groupings, forums and experts. D. She'll form technical working groups as necessary. B. E. She'll outline the policy, administrative reform proposals, and implementation modalities for each identified challenge area. F. She'll consider and propose appropriate mechanisms for coordination, collaboration and cooperation among institutions to bring about the sought changes. G. She'll pay special attention to making practical interventions that will entrench honorable behavior, integrity and inclusivity in leading social sectors. H. She'll hold such number of meetings in such places and at such times as the committee, in consultation with its secretaries, shall consider necessary for the proper discharge of its functions. I. She'll solicit, receive and consider written memoranda or information from the public, and j. May carry out or cause to be carried out such assessments, studies or research, as may inform its mandate. 3. The joint secretaries will be responsible for official communication on behalf of the task force. 4. The joint secretaries may co-opt any other persons, as and when necessary, to assist in the achievement of the terms of reference. 5. The task force shall make periodic written recommendations for action by the government and will submit its comprehensive advice not later than 12, 12 months from the date of its official launch. His Excellency the President may, if necessary, extend the period. Dated the 24th May, 2018. Joseph K. Kinua, Head of the Public Service. Contents. Abbreviations and Acronyms. Page 6. Executive Summary. Page 7. Reading the BBI Report. Page 18. Chapter 1. Notable Issues That Kenyans Must Deal With. Page 21. Chapter 2. Lack of a National Ethos. Page 30. Major Recommendations. Page 31. Chapter 3. Responsibilities and Rights. Page 37. Major Recommendations. Page 39. Chapter 4. Ethnic Antagonism and Competition. Page 44. Major Recommendations. Page 45. Chapter 5. Divisive Elections. Page 48. Major Recommendations. Page 50. Chapter 6. Inclusivity. Page 57. Major Recommendations. Page 59. Chapter 7. Shared Prosperity. Page 63. Major Recommendations. Page 66. Chapter 8. Corruption. Page 73. Major Recommendations. Page 75. Chapter 9. Devolution. Page 80. Major Recommendations. Page 82. Chapter 10. Safety and Security. Page 88. Major. Recommendations. Page 90. Chapter 11. Commissions and Cross-Cutting Issues. Page 94. Chapter 12. Conclusion. Page 98. Annex 1. Detailed Recommendations. Page 100. Annex 2. Joint Communique. Building Bridges. Page 127. Annex 3. Participation. Page 135. Abbreviations and Acronyms. BBI. Building Bridges Initiative. CRA. Commission on Revenue Allocation. CSO. Civil Society Organization. DPP. Director of Public Prosecutions. EACC. Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. ECD. Early Childhood Development. GDP. Gross Domestic Product. IEBC. Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission. JSC. Judicial Service Commission. MCA. Member of County Assembly. MDAs. Ministries, Departments and Agencies. MP. Member of Parliament. MPSA. Mobile Money Transfer Service in Kenya. NCIC. National Cohesion and Integration Commission. NHIF. National Hospital Insurance Fund. NIS. National Intelligence Service. NPS. National Police Service. NGO. Non-Governmental Organization. NIS. National Intelligence Service. PSC. Public Service Commission. PWDs. Persons with Disabilities. SRC. Salaries and Remuneration Commission. UNEP. United Nations Environment Program. Executive Summary. The Building Bridges to Unity Advisory Presidential Task Force has submitted this report which reflects some of the most extensive public consultations ever undertaken by a similar body in Kenyan history. The task force visited all 47 counties and it heard from an inclusive group of citizens from every constituency that paid attention to gender, ethnic and religious diversity, youth, elders, persons living with disability, civil society, and the public and private sectors. The face of Kenya was captured in this process.
The task force heard from more than 400 elected leaders past and present, prominent local voices from the community, and young people who added their voice to citizens in the counties. This included more than 35 governors and their deputies, as well as dozens of senators, MPs, and MCAs in the counties and in Nairobi. Submissions were given by 123 individuals representing major institutions, including constitutional bodies and major stakeholders in the public and private sectors, 261 individuals and organizations who sent memoranda via email, and 755 citizens who offered handwritten submissions during public forums in the counties. Kenyans made their views heard as individual citizens, institutionally, and based on diverse interests and experiences. This report reflects their views and insights. Kenyans feel Kenyan when political competition and the use of ethnicity as an organizing tool are at rest between elections. Across the country, they are extremely concerned at the poor values we express as a people and a leadership crisis at multiple levels, reflected above all in the continuing elevated levels of corruption. Kenyans are tired of elections that bring the economy to a standstill every few years and feel that politics has become too adversarial while trying to entrench itself in every facet of their waking lives. They would like a more stable and predictable politics that is democratic and produces governance at the national and county levels that is inclusive of our ethnic, religious, and regional diversity. While a major focus of this report, again reflecting what we heard from Kenyans, is about government and the public service, the country is far more worried by the lack of jobs and income. This has led to so much poverty, inequality and frustrated hopes that our continuity as a unified and secure country is uncertain, should we persist in the present course. We desperately need a shift in our economic paradigm if we are to provide enough jobs to our youth and have enough revenue to meet the service and welfare needs of Kenyans. This report is structured to respond to the nine major national challenges to a united Kenya that were contained in the joint communique issued following the famous handshake of 9 March 2018. However, before going forward, the task force would like to give a special note of thanks and recognition to Wright. Honorable. Ryla A. Adinga, EGH. As earlier indicated, the task force was responding to the joint communique that was agreed by the two leaders. Their bold step and support in establishing this process have become milestones in the building of bipartisanship and unity in Kenyan history and further afield. Knowing well the Kenyan tendency to keep report reading light and thus to focus mostly on executive summaries, we urge every Kenyan to go deeper into the report. The different chapters are linked and missing the context and analysis in one leads to a shortfall in understanding the recommendations in others. The nine core challenges in the order they are presented in the report are Lack of a national ethos Responsibilities and rights of citizenship Ethnic antagonism and competition Divisive elections Inclusivity Shared prosperity Corruption Devolution And safety and security the major recommendations are made at the end of each of the chapters dealing with these challenges, while Annex 1 lists the recommendations in detail. The challenges are preceded by key observations made by the task force in the Notable Issues chapter on matters of such gravity that the task force feels impelled to share them. They frame many of the specific recommendations that will follow and therefore should be regarded as integral to the report. National Ethics we lack shared beliefs, ideals and aspirations about what Kenya can become if we all subscribe to a national ethos that builds and reinforces our unity. This report is a historic opportunity for us to begin willingly defining, developing and subscribing to an enduring collective vision that would lead to a united Kenya, equal to all its major challenges. It would appreciate and honor excellence in leadership, in the civic practices of citizenship, and in our care and consideration of one another. Such an ethos would be deeply respectful of differences in culture, heritage, beliefs and religions. Its character would guide and constrict the planning and actions of the state to the benefit of the people of Kenya. The journey to developing such a national ethos begins by accepting the desperate need for it. That is the most important recommendation made in this report. Kenya is made up of cultures that have endured for many generations and that have at their core the development of ethical and honorable people. Our national ethos will emerge from expanding our sense of belonging beyond our blood ties so that we come to regard every Kenyan and our collective existence as a nation to be worthy of our personal commitment and ownership. We will need to have conversations and initiatives that allow us to innovatively combine the young, dynamic and urbanizing cultures with the enduring wisdom of our diverse cultures. This is bottom-up work, starting in the family and the community, supported by initiatives that embrace the positive cultures, beliefs and ideals of Kenya's diverse communities, and facilitated by civil society, the private sector, and state institutions. 
it will become embedded in the formal education system, starting from the earliest age and lasting for a lifetime, religious and cultural institutions, the media, and our arts sector. It will not be an ethos made of a single note, but will be a complex song of many voices that are inspired by the desire to contribute to, own and build a nation to which we all belong. A Kenya in which a Kenyan's character of embracing hard work, honesty, integrity, and respectful behavior will be recognized and rewarded. Among other important recommendations, the task force believes it is profoundly important that we give ourselves an official and inclusive national history of every community and stretching back a thousand years. Knowledge of our histories is necessary for us to see far into the future. The task force has also recommended the formation of an ethics commission to sit under the office of the president that will keep track of and support the diverse efforts to develop, build and entrench a new national ethos. Responsibilities and Rights of Citizenship Kenya is increasingly a nation of distinct individuals instead of an individually distinct nation. And we have placed too much emphasis on what the nation can do for each of us our rights and given almost no attention to what we each must do for our nation. Our Responsibilities the task force calls for us to develop a responsibility and execution culture through mechanisms embedded in schools. There is also a recommendation that leaders in public service personally use the services they govern to increase skin in the game. The need for educated parenting is flagged as key to raising healthy and responsible children in an increasingly complex and fast-changing Kenya. The duties articulated in the African Charter on Human and People's Rights should be included in civics curriculums as Kenyans undergo continuous training throughout their lives. The task force also believes that Kenyan holders of dual citizenship should be equal citizens. The Kenyan constitution, reflecting the deepest shared ideals of our nation, makes it a requirement that the human rights of every Kenyan be protected by all Kenyans and by every organ and office of the state. At present, unfortunately there is an emerging political practice that seeks to create two lanes to citizenship, whereby one group of citizens, by virtue of their dual citizenship, should not have the equal rights to serve in government. Regarding Kenyans with dual citizenship as being somehow untrustworthy or unworthy amounts to discrimination and a lowered standard of protection and recognition. Kenyans willing to serve should be judged according to their character and track record and not presumed to have split loyalties that compromise their integrity or patriotism. Furthermore, there is little argument about how valuable the learning, remittances and voice of Kenyans in the diaspora are to the prosperity and well-being of Kenyans. Many members of the diaspora, if not the majority, yearn to return home to serve their fellow Kenyans while hoping that their children, born abroad, will one day also return home and take up their place. The limits to the ability of holders of dual citizenship from serving Kenyans should therefore be highly limited. One such acceptable instance is in regard to the defense forces, which constitutionally are responsible for the defense and protection of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the republic. This means that, in defense of Kenya, they may be called on to take up arms against the armed forces of other countries in which they may hold citizenship. In this rare but still possible scenario, there would be potential legal penalties for the Kenyan with dual citizenship if Kenya's defense forces undertake hostile actions against his or her other country of citizenship. In light of these observations, the task force recommends that the only limit to state service by Kenyans with dual citizenship be the commander-in-chief of the defense forces, members of the defense forces, and the membership of the defense council. Ethnic antagonism and competition, these are a major threat to Kenya's success and to the very continuity of our country. The task force calls for us to do away with a winner-take-all model for the presidency and opt for a more consociational model that works best for ethnically divided societies. All political parties should also be compelled to reflect the face of Kenya in ethnic, religious, regional, and gender terms. Individual Kenyans should be educated, exposed, and incentivized to respect ethnic and religious diversity, and this principle should be reflected in the public service. In addition, the per capita share of national resources for every Kenyan should be carefully balanced to account for every Kenyan being treated as equal, as the Constitution makes clear, while ensuring that those who have been marginalized in the past or are being marginalized at present are given extra help where they need it. Regional integration should be accelerated to change the ethnic calculus of our politics, with the East African Community Project to achieve political federation following confederation being accelerated. To ensure that we deepen our unity, the task force recommends that the president, as the symbol of national unity, should benefit from the private advice of eminent, experienced, and honorable citizens serving in a council of advisors on a non-salaried basis. Divisive elections. 
in our rush to adopt and even mimic foreign models, particularly from the democratic West, we have forged a politics that is a contest of us versus them. And we have chosen our us and them on an ethnic basis, especially in competing for the presidency, which is the highest office in Kenyan politics. Lack of inclusivity is the leading contributor to divisive and conflict-causing elections. Kenyans associate the winner-take-all system with divisive elections and want an end to it. The task force recommends a system that addresses our unique needs, especially in forging a homegrown or autochthonous national executive structure, with an executive president who will be head of state and government and commander-in-chief, and be the central symbol of national unity, who appoints a prime minister to deliver on the day-to-day -day implementation of policy. The president shall be elected through universal suffrage. For a candidate to be declared the winner of the presidential election, he or she must win 50% plus one of the presidential votes, and at least 25% of the votes cast in each of more than half of the counties, as is now the case. The president will remain the head of state and government, commander-in-chief, and be the central symbol of national unity. He shall chair the cabinet that compromises the deputy president, the prime minister, and cabinet ministers. The task force has called for the retaining of the present two-term limit of presidential terms. A prime minister? The role of a prime minister will be crucial in strengthening inclusivity and accountability. It will ensure that the work of government is better overseen by parliament, while also ensuring greater inclusivity from political parties with strength in the National Assembly. Within a set number of days following the summoning of parliament after an election, the president shall appoint as prime minister an elected member of the National Assembly from a political party, having a majority of members in the National Assembly, or, if no political party has a majority, one who appears to have the support of a majority of MPs. The nominee shall not assume office until his or her nomination is first confirmed by a resolution of the National Assembly, supported by a majority vote of the members. The nominee for prime minister shall not assume office until his or her appointment is first confirmed by a resolution of the National Assembly, supported by an absolute majority vote of MPs. If the prime minister nominee is not confirmed, the president shall have another set number of days to make another appointment. This process shall continue until there is a successful nomination for prime minister, a measure to ensure that this process is not indefinite and that governance is continuous should be considered. The prime minister may be dismissed by the president or through a vote of no confidence in the National Assembly. The prime minister shall have authority over the supervision and execution of the day-to-day -day functions and affairs of the government. He or she shall be the leader of government business in the National Assembly. On the president's tasking, the prime minister will chair cabinet subcommittees. In the exercise of his authority, the prime minister shall perform or cause to be performed any matter or matters which the president directs to be done. The Prime Minister will continue to earn his or her salary as a member of Parliament, with no additional salary for the Prime Ministerial role. The task force recommends that to avoid the politicization of the public service, the permanent or principal secretaries will not be subject to parliamentary approval. Their accountability will be strictly administrative and technical. The work of these senior administrative officers will be coordinated by the permanent principal secretary in the office of the prime minister, who will chair the technical implementation committee of principal permanent secretaries. Cabinet. The cabinet is a crucial part of the executive arm of government. Similarly, its structure is critical to an inclusive and efficient government. The current debate on whether the cabinet adds enough value in governance and delivery has revolved around three key issues. The first issue has been whether it ought to be a cabinet of technocrats, like the American system, or whether it should be composed of elected members of parliament, akin to the British parliamentary system. There is discontent with the current system, judging from what Kenyans told the task force. The task force proposes that the cabinet be structured as follows. The president will appoint cabinet ministers after consultation with the prime minister. The ministers shall be responsible for the offices that the president establishes in line with the constitution. The cabinet shall be drawn from both parliamentarians and technocrats, with the latter being made ex officio members of parliament upon successful parliamentary approval. The task force is also recommending that the cabinet secretary be renamed cabinet minister. To ensure more effective political direction and parliamentary accountability, there shall be a position of minister of state that will be appointed from members of the National Assembly and taking direction in their ministerial duties from cabinet ministers. These ministers of state will continue to earn their salary as MP, with no additional salary for their ministerial role. The task force further recommends eliminating the post of chief administrative secretary. 
the runner-up of the presidential election becomes an ex officio member of parliament and the leader of the official opposition if his or her party is not represented in the government or of a coalition of parliamentary parties not represented in the government. The leader of the official opposition shall be enabled to have a shadow cabinet to challenge the government's positions in parliament. Representation. A critical part of the task force's recommendations is on representation. The success and sustainability of democracy, to a great extent, depends on the fairness of representation in the electoral system. Kenyans expressed a powerful attachment to their right to fair representation that is accessible and responds to their needs. In light of this, the task force strongly recommends that whatever form reforms to representation take, that they accord to the following principles if Kenyans are to be fairly and equally represented, that the people's choice, as reflected in the election of their representatives, including in party primaries and nominations, shall be upheld through fair, free and transparent elections. This principle should be provided for in the Political Parties Act. Individuals included in any party lists shall initially have undergone a process that uses transparent public participation in the counties, even before any other vetting procedure is used. This principle should be provided for in the Political Parties Act that there shall be the equalization of representation and equality of citizenship, as much as possible, by ensuring that each Kenyan vote has the same status and power as envisaged in the Constitution. Parties should be compelled through the Political Parties Act to be consistent with the Constitution to meet the gender rule and other constitutional measures of inclusion through their party lists. This will equalize both genders and political terms, rather than creating a parallel system that creates a sense of tokenism. Party lists for members of county assemblies shall follow the same principles and processes of public participation, elections and vetting as the National Assembly. This will ensure that the people and parties can ensure that there is accountability in a direct manner. The existing constituencies will be saved, including the protected seats, because they have become key for representation of sparsely populated areas. The nomination lists through parties should be completed in a transparent process governed by the political parties overseen by the Registrar of Political Parties and the IEBC. There are also recommendations by the Task Force on changes to the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission. Inclusivity. In its consultations, the Task Force heard a lot about the desire for inclusivity and came to understand that Kenyans have a very particular ethnic interpretation of this principle that is changing fast, particularly due to rapid urbanization. The task force found that Kenyans, at core, interpret inclusivity in very political terms, as who gets what, when and how, and focus on the authoritative allocation of resources and values. They therefore yearn for more inclusion in executive power, at the national and county levels, as articulated in the section on divisive elections. Connected to this is Kenyans' need for fair and equal representation, and their desire to respond to the inequality in the power of the vote that has grown over the years, with some areas needing many more votes to elect a representative. The task force makes major recommendations on increasing inclusivity on a political, economic, social, religious, cultural, youth, and gender basis. It also seeks to reduce the ironic phenomenon of those marginalized at the national level, being responsible for marginalizing others in the counties. A critical aspect of inclusivity is that it must be perceived as reality, especially in job allocation in the public service, which should reflect the ethnic, religious, regional, and cultural face of Kenya, and should be free of corruption in recruitment. An elevated concern is in corruption in the recruitment of Kenyans into the disciplined services, which causes incoming officers to be inducted into a bribe-demanding culture right from the start of their careers. The task force recommends an out-of-the-box solution to utilize private sector recruitment companies with internationally reputable brands to help in filling the recruitment pool for the disciplined services in a way that reflects merit and the face of Kenya. Shared Prosperity We need an economic revolution to build an economy that can produce the jobs we need urgently. Kenyans speaking in every consulting session run by the task force in every county spoke of their problems fed by poverty and joblessness or underemployment. No country has progressed based on such disparities including corruption, exclusion, increasing poverty, hunger, unemployment and persistent inequalities, while lacking a common national character. The single most important matter facing Kenyans when it comes to shared prosperity is generating enough jobs and employment, particularly for young people. It is not enough to merely improve our economic output and present rates of investment. We must entirely transform the way our economy operates if we are to deal with the present lack of jobs. It is therefore crucial for us to build an economy that is founded on the principles and practices of value creation, and that rejects the extractive model as the primary mode of economic activity.
This will require a new economic paradigm for jobs and prosperity that raises national domestic savings beyond 25 percent, that enables rapid growth of labor-intensive manufacturing through deeper regional integration, and that uses economic coordination by the state, though not state ownership, to grow markets and industries. Kenya will become more prosperous, with far more jobs created, if we deepen our regional integration with neighboring countries in achieving a genuine common market, underpinned by eventual political federation. The future of the global economy is in innovation and invention, using intellectual property, genes, and the living bodies of knowledge developed by generation after generation of our people. Kenyan laws must be fashioned to protect these resources fiercely, and the government structured to project compliance throughout the world. This should be accompanied by frameworks for use that maximize the ability of Kenyans to build upon these properties. To build actual wealth and jobs, a surge in entrepreneurship will be needed and should be provided through widespread training and macro and microeconomic policies that favor startups and small growing businesses. We will need to think big and long term if we are building an industrialized economy that meets the needs of the current and future generations. We must start with a 50-year plan that has as its aim, Kenya joining the world's most prosperous, shared and sustainable economies. To ensure that our prosperity is indeed shared, the task force calls for the entrenching of Article 43 on economic and social rights in political platforms and national policy. It also recommends using scarce public resources for development not bureaucracy by targeting a ratio or ceiling, written into law of 70-30 for development versus recurrent expenditure. In addition, young people should be allowed more employment and livelihood chances by government, making it easier for small businesses to compete and grow. Corruption. The growing public perception of Kenya having a rigged system that rewards cronyism and corruption, as opposed to the productive and hardworking, is the greatest risk to Kenya's cohesion and security. Tackling corruption is the single most important mission Kenya has now. Many Kenyans told the task force that it is the lure of illicit financial gain through the holding of elected or appointed positions that drives much of the aggressive and negative ethnicization and even militarization of political competition. The task force makes major and actionable recommendations on freeing Kenya from cartel capture, that public officers should not be in business with government, and that wealth declaration forms should be made public, including a written narrative of how wealth above KSHS 50 million was acquired. It also calls for making Kenya a 100% e-services nation by digitizing all government services, processes, payment systems, and record-keeping. These services must be secured from criminal tampering. The task force calls for more resignations to show that leaders in executive positions should take responsibility for disasters on their watch by resigning. The task force has also recommended that strong reforms need to be undertaken to increase public confidence in the judiciary, which at the moment is relatively low. The task force understands that core constitutional principles in Kenya are the separation of powers between arms of government and accountability to the people of Kenya. This means that in undertaking reforms, the independence of the judiciary must be protected as a fundamental principle, while the judiciary should be accountable in a clear manner to the sovereign people of Kenya. Devolution. Devolution has largely been a success. However, devolution is still frustrated by serious challenges that if unaddressed, will raise questions about its political and economic sustainability. Kenyans overwhelmingly told the task force that they wanted their counties to remain as they are, but with services further decentralized to the ward level, and that each ward should benefit by receiving at least 30% of the development fund in each five-year term. Kenyans want far better service delivery and for development projects to receive enough oversight to prevent wastage and corruption. Kenyans told the task force that they lament the devolution of corruption and impunity to the county governments and called for strong anti-corruption measures to be taken. The same calls for inclusion that were made by Kenyans regarding the national government were made for the counties. The winner-take-all phenomenon in counties following elections is said by many Kenyans to lead to discrimination, inequality, and inequity in resource distribution. The task force calls for the retention of the 47 counties and for support to the voluntary process of counties forming regional economic blocks. Depending on further consultation with Kenyans, consider that while Kenyans are strong supporters of devolution in their counties, they also want better value for money and more money to be used for development as opposed to high recurrent and administrative costs. Perhaps there is a way that the 47 counties can be maintained as the focus of development implementation and the provision of services, while representation and legislation are undertaken in larger regional blocks.
It recommends increasing the resources to the counties by at least 35% of the last audited accounts and ensuring that the focus is on service delivery in the settled and serviced areas, including for people living near the furthest boundaries. Public resources should follow people not land mass. Meaning that services provided by the counties must be as equal as possible by population, and there should be investment in critical areas such as health, agriculture, and the urban areas, while taking account of past and existing marginalization. The aim should be for all Kenyans to have to cover the same distances to access public services. The task force proposes changes to the county executive, including, but not limited to, the running mate of every candidate for the position of governor being of the opposite gender. Steps should be taken to strengthen the ability of the members of county assemblies in providing proper oversight on the county government. At a minimum, this should be done by ensuring that the transmission and management of county assembly budgets are insulated from arbitrary or politically motivated interference by county executives. These processes should also be subjected to rigorous public finance management processes. Recognizing the critical importance of growing the national economy, the task force calls for counties to encourage their residents to be more entrepreneurial and to compete for investment from other parts of the country and abroad to flow into the county. In addition, a recommendation is made to strengthen dialogue and the integration of communities in the counties, especially those that are multi-ethnic, with a focus on ensuring minorities are heard and respected. Safety and security. Kenyans told the task force that they do not feel sufficiently safe and secure. The task force noted the dangerous region Kenya is in and the continuing threats of terrorism, failing or fragile states and countries with territorial ambitions, police abuses and rogue illegal actions that violate human rights. The task force strongly recommends that the value of a Kenyan life impacted by violence, insecurity and poor safety standards should be the same across Kenya in terms of police response, investigation and prosecution. A life in an upscale Nairobi suburb should be equally protected as one in Loima village. It also calls for every incoming president within three months of taking office to publish a comprehensive national security and safety strategy and renew it two years later. It should be proactive, preventive, and preemptive, while reflecting the priorities and needs of the entire government, as well as all sectors of society. There is also an urgent need to strengthen the performance and public service orientation of the National Police Service, as well as supporting the mental health and wellness of officers. Commissions and Cross-Cutting Issues the task force recommends the transfer of work reporting on promoting and enforcing ethical conduct to a proposed ethics commission in the chapter on national ethics. This will mean separating the obligation to conduct criminal investigations from the obligation to promote and enforce ethics in public service. It also calls for strengthening the Directorate of Criminal Investigations to complement the independence of the criminal justice system, which includes the Director of Public Prosecutions and the Judiciary. There should also be an, an increase in the resources for the Director of Public Prosecutions to enable effective prosecutions. The task force strongly recommends that regulation in Kenya be simplified and made more transparent and predictable. This can start with the rationalizing of the mandates of regulatory bodies to ensure lack of duplication and to ease transparency, affordability and prompt service to enable higher levels of regulatory compliance. The task force has recommended that it is critical that every organ and arm of government be accountable to the people of Kenya. That means that every independent commission must have internal accountability systems that clearly and transparently separate the power of appointment and promotion from that of interdiction and censure. In addition, rigorous audits that inquire into value for money and upholding sound principles of public finance management should apply to every arm of government and every public institution. The task force in listening to views on resource sharing and the provision of services has come to the conclusion that Nairobi, by virtue of being the national capital and an extraterritorial seat of the United Nations, which is the city as its third global headquarters, is dissimilar to other counties. The Kenyan people look to the capital as the seat of all arms of government and as a critical location for their civic participation in national life. This means that the Commission of Revenue Allocation formula would struggle to take into consideration the special status of Nairobi and the demands for services that come with it. Further to this consideration is Capital City, the 26 March 1975 agreement between the Republic of Kenya and the United Nations, regarding the headquarters of the UN Environment Programme in Nairobi, agrees actions by the national government that touch on the environment, infrastructure, amenities, public services, and accessibility of the headquarters.
to demonstrate the far-reaching implications of the agreement, consider its agreement that the headquarters seat shall be supplied with the necessary services, including without limitation by reason of this enumeration, electricity, water, sewerage, gas, post, telephone, telegraph, local transportation, drainage, collection of refuse, and fire protection. It also holds that in case of any threatened interruption of such services, the appropriate Kenyan authorities shall consider the needs of UNEP as being of equal importance with those of essential agencies of the government. These actions are agreed with the national government and not the county government. The status of Nairobi as host of a global UN headquarters is a big reason why it has become a diplomatic hub, with dozens of countries establishing missions that will allow them representation at UNEP and other UN bodies governed from Nairobi. These missions in turn demand a minimum level of services and facilitation from the national government. The task force recommends that Nairobi be accorded a special status as capital city that allows the national government the means to provide the services and facilitation necessary to maintaining it as a capital city and as a diplomatic hub. At the same time, such a special status should not impede the rights of the Kenyan people to representation at the ward and parliamentary levels. Thank you for taking your time to listen to this audiovisual translation of the BBI report. This marks the end of the introduction part of the BBI report and the beginning of Chapter 1 of the 12 chapters, plus Annex 1, 2 and 3. If you have found this audiovisual report to be of help in understanding the BBI report, kindly share it with other members of our community who may not have ample time to read the report but can manage to listen to this audiovisual report as they engage themselves in doing something else. Lastly, for the time it took us to compile this audiovisual report, we will be so much grateful if you can subscribe to our channel and hit the notification button so that you can know when we upload the other chapters of the BBI report. Asenteni sana. See you in Chapter 1 of the BBI report in audiovisual format. I'm naff. And it's not yet enough till we hit the last chapter. Cheers.